Uh, so my name is John Penn, and I do manage the uh, development, impl implementation, and automation of all the variant calling pipelines that we run at the Regeneron Genetic Center. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Regeneron Genetic Center and a little bit about kind of the evolution of our whole exome sequence pipelines over the course of the last few years. Um, so at Regeneron, is this not? There it goes. So at Regeneron, we take a lot of pride in our corporate culture, which really values science. Uh, we talk a lot about our, our scientific rigor and, and making sure that kind of science drives our business decisions. Business doesn't drive our, our science. And <clears throat> with that kind of thought in mind about how best to apply our science to really deliver first-in-class therapeutics that, that really improve patient outcomes, the Regeneron Genetic Center w was conceived several years ago with the idea that, you know, I, I, a statement I think really clearly encapsulated by this quote from Aris Barris, the head of the RGC, which is, we really feel that if you are not exploring human genetics, you are not doing modern day drug discovery. Um, and of course, there's an ever growing body of evidence to support that, not surprisingly, that when you leverage human genetic information in your drug development processes, you can si significantly improve on this 90% of drugs that fail sometime in their development life cycle. It does lead to, of course, monetary savings. Personally, I'm, I'm much more interested in the, in the personnel hours and time that's saved, not chasing down kind of spurious leads. And again, with our ultimate goal of really helping patients by, by delivering effective and, and safe medications. Um, now, at Regeneron, again, with our, our science culture, we're very collaborative as well. And we make a point to not be siloed in any of our science. So anything that we discover or any hypotheses we generate in the, in the Regeneron Genetic Center, we like to permeate across all kind of our business units and, and various scientific groups. So we can use hypotheses we generate around our human genetics data to feed into our, our, our first-in-class Velocigene and mouse models and with knocking in and out genes to, to see how that actually affects phenotypes in, from a genetic perspective. We can also take hypotheses generated in other regions of, uh, or other divisions at Regeneron to inform how we really evaluate the human genetics we're seeing in, our, in the cohorts that we study. Now, from a high level, that's, that's kind of the same perspective that we have in terms of the cohort breadth we, we really evaluate at, at the Regeneron Genetic Center. I mean, we can look at uh, phenotypic specific cohorts and, and see how that's actually affected when we look into family trios and, and transmission rates from parents to children. We can look into these founder populations where there's absolutely elevation of rare variation and seeing how that actually plays out in our general population cohorts like Geisinger and, and the UK Biobank. Um, I mentioned the UK Biobank because that is the most notable, I think, of our current projects. Uh, it was announced a couple times, been announced, I guess, a couple times in the last few years. Uh, so Regeneron, along with uh, a number of pharma partners, has committed to exome sequencing the 500,000 individuals that are participants in the UK Biobank. Uh, I'll say this is something I'm personally very, very proud to be a part of. Uh, because of the scope and breadth of it, the 500,000 individuals with extensive electronic medical records from a single point of care with the National Health Service in England that's going to be continually updated, and the fact that this data set is eventually going to be made public and available to any researcher who, who applies with a valid research plan, and we're in the process of building what is, I think, the most important genetic data set of our lifetime. Now, committing to sequencing 500,000 exomes over the course of two years on top of the other projects and cohorts we're sequencing is not a small feat. Uh, we're fortunate to have a very innovative head of our lab sequencing operations, John Overton, who's built a fully automated library prep uh, and that feeds into kind of feed, feeding the beast of our exome sequencing cap, uh, capacity to sequence currently at well over 300,000 exomes a year, which feeds into our 100% cloud-based uh, informatics and analytical pipelines. Uh, now, when I say 100% cloud-based, I really mean it. Uh, any of you who have seen talks from us before may have seen the slide before. In our very first space, we had a, an empty room that was our data center with a picture of the cloud taped on the wall. Um, I was very proud to be a part of this first demonstration of our smoke machine, which actually set off the smoke detectors and resulted in seven fire trucks, a locked data center door, and a confiscated smoke machine. Um, with that, I'll, I'll move a little bit more to kind of the evolution of our pipelines. So again, any of you who have seen talks by Jeff Reed uh, know that we are cat friendly at the RGC, and by that I mean we all have cats. Uh, 
I'm pretty sure that Jeff has a number of Angora cat sweaters at home, but I have not yet seen them. But we do name all of our pipelines after cats, uh, version one being the American Bobtail, Abyssinian, and our current pipeline, Seal Point Balinese, which we are using for the UK Biobank uh, data. So considerations when we were building our very first pipeline. <laughs> when we started, we, we had really starting from scratch, though most of us had uh, quite a bit of experience in the industry, wanted to make some, some judicious choices about the tools we employed. Um, anyone who has done variant calling with bioinformatics knows there, there are a number of tools that all pretty much perform equivalently. Uh, we did select a GATK kind of best practices pipeline, not because I necessarily feel like it's the best tool, but again, anyone who does what I do will tell you, no one will ever ask you why you're using GATK, but pretty much everyone will ask you why you're not. Uh, we did use uh, this on HG19. We, we, this was, again, about six years ago. Um, <laughs> in our pipelines, we, again, made this judicious decision to kind of separate it into two main categories, our single sample variant calling and then our cohort level kind of joint genotyping cohorts. So for our automated price processes, as samples come off our sequencers, they are launched automatically into alignment and variant calling, <laughs> generating all the QC metrics like head home ratio, novel variants that get fed automatically back into visualization, visualization software that's used by our lab sequencing operations to validate that things are performing as they should. We also capture out of that our the, the variants for each individual that we sequence and plug that into our every variant ever, called our Eve database. Uh, along with the variant calls themselves, we would track the kind of general metrics around that, the, the, the format fields of, of depth, genotype quality, et cetera. At our various punctuation points when we deliver data, we would do a joint genotyping, but we'd do those in these 200 sample blocks. We actually didn't genotype our joint genotype across the full cohort, and I'll go into that in just a moment but to validate that, or to ensure that it, we captured homozygous reference and no call variation uh, in that call set appropriately, we would include a pseudo sample when we joint genotype in these 200 sample blocks that would carry variation at any site where any individual in the cohort had a variant. So 200 sample bundles. I've actually talked about this a lot in the last five years, but generally with our, our collaborators to establish where we wanted to sit in our joint genotyping, knowing, knowing that we were going to have this incremental growth, particularly with the guys in your data set, our first one, with 10,000, 15, 50, 100,000 individuals. We wanted to see where was kind of the sweet spot in terms of joint genotyping. Because of the algorithms employed uh, in, in many of the, in, in the joint genotyper, uh, there, was, there was serious concern about losing particularly rare variation as, as sensitivity kind of goes away. So we, we empirically wanted to look at this. We took eight samples from the Ceph pedigree, including the NA12878 sample, uh, and used the Illumina Platinum genome calls for them as kind of our true set, and <laughs> bundled them with contemporaneously sequenced samples at the RGC in increasing bundle size, 100, 200, 600, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, and 15,000 samples. Um, I'll say this was kind of what I expected. We saw that you know sensitivity kind of peaked at a couple hundred samples and started to drop off actually when we hit about 2,000. Uh, what I, I actually found surprising at the time was how quickly the positive predictive value dropped off and the false discovery rate increased <laughs> as you had increasing number of samples. And what we found was that because of the prior set by the joint genotyping algorithms that the the larger a cohort size you had, the more common variation was elevated, uh, showing variants in samples with really little or no evidence of that actual variant, but just relying on the prior set by the statistical models. So with those 200 sample bundles and our, our single sample data, we would actually, at our data freezes, deliver a, a really robust data package, with the idea being that for optimum use of our data and to really fuel discovery both internally at Regeneron and externally with our collaborators, you have to give people data in all the various ways that they may want to consume it. <laughs> so for the single sample data, we would produce the, the GVCFs from our GATK haplotype caller, uh, a VQSR, the variant quality score recalibrated VCFs, again from GATK, and we would generate three PVCFs. Um, so the PVCF being the squared off matrix, including every individual with every site that anyone carried variation. Uh, we have the various filtration levels of that, our level one being completely unfiltered, uh, level two slightly more stringent, and level three our, our most stringent filter. 
additionally, we like to provide uh, a loss of function roll-ups where we count uh, putative loss of function variants across genes and roll those up in a bundle so that gene-based analyses can be done against phenotypes. We have our relationship estimations that we put together for, with our Primus algorithm that was written by Jeff Staples, uh, a member of our R&D group in genome informatics. And the CLAMS call, or CNV calls, again, an in-house developed tool by Jonathan Packer and Evan Maxwell, again, of our R&D group. And then we also provide genotype chip files. Now, for both the PVCF and the genotype chip, we, we provide files in both the PVCF, VCF format, and we also provide stuff in the, in the Plink format, the BedBim FAM, so that if people who want to take, you know, maybe that richer VCF data set, but access it in, in a way that's a lot more comfortable for them with a tool they've worked with for a, lot of time, or for a long time, they can use the, the Plink data, or excuse me, data format. <laughs> so after a year and a half or so, we started looking at updating our pipeline, so moving to version two of, of our pipeline, we moved to Abyssinian. Uh, the big update here was that we, we moved to the GRCH38 reference. And this was the, the real heavy lift on, on this particular update. Uh, the rest of the tool updates were, were, there was no tool changes, just really updates to BWA, SAM Tools, Picard, and GATK. Um, but we wanted to move a little early to, to the new reference because we were increasing the number of samples we were processing and we recognized that at some point soon we'd have to make that switch anyway and have to go back and reprocess all the data done to that point. So when we made this switch, we did go back and take about the 105,000 samples that we had done previously and brought them up to the new reference with the new pipeline so that our data is actually very, very consistent from the very first sample we, we sequenced to, uh, to current time. Uh, joint genotyping, we continued with our 200 sample bundles, and, but we did make a, a slight adjustment to our filtering strategy. Um, uh, to the, we call them our Goldilocks filters. And I've only recently realized as we've dealt with more and more international collaborators that uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears is not a ubiquitous story. It uh, is very American. And most of, actually my, my favorite was when George S. Menios went and Googled Goldilocks. He got a wrestler from the 60s. Uh, <laughs> so for those of you not familiar with the story, I'm happy to share it with you at a break, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. But the idea being that we take our unfiltered PVCF and we filter in a way that's not too hot, not too cold, but just right to generate our Goldilocks PVCF. Uh, one additional thing that we added in, in the Abyssinian data freeze is we uh, normalize our multi-allelic variants. Um, for many, many years, uh, multi-allelic variants have been kind of discarded in these larger cohorts because people thought they weren't really valid. What we found with our increasing cohort sizes is that the number of multi-allelic variants that you see across the data set increases significantly, and you lose uh, quite a bit of data by not including those, those variant sites. So, at our data freezes with Abyssinian, uh, again, we moved from one, or excuse me, from three PVCFs to the two, our unfiltered and our Goldilocks, where we filter SNPs and indels at a slightly different rate just because of the, the nature of, of indel calling having a, a much higher kind of false positive rate. We still deliver everything that we delivered previously in terms of our LOF rollups, our relatedness, clams calls, and, and chip data. So moving on to our, our most recent pipeline update, uh, and this has by far been the most, uh, I think, kind of revolutionary for us in terms of, uh, of pipeline updates. And this actually involved the implementation of two new tools, both of which we worked on with uh, the developers for, uh, for quite a while while, while working with our GAT pipeline. Um, for the single sample pipeline, we now employ a variant caller called WeCall that comes from Genomics PLC and is based on the old Platypus variant caller. Uh, and we worked with them for, for several years, kind of tuning that on our data. Uh, our joint genotyping is now handled by GLNexus, which uh, Mike Lynn from DNA Nexus and Ohad Rode uh, worked on, and, and Mike has spoken on both uh, at this meeting and at AGBT of 2018, or uh, February of last year, excuse me. Uh, and we apply our, uh, kind of a new Goldilocks filter where we no longer use the, uh, a metric that was very GATK specific. So questions about why we made a switch to WeCall, I, I kind of try to answer with this. This is kind of the high level, one sample version of, of quite a bit of evaluation we did of the tool. Taking the NA12878 genome in a bottle sample and evaluating how it, again, sequenced in-house, and evaluating how it performed with the two callers, looking across the high confidence regions. Not surprisingly, as with most tools, SNPs are kind of a wash in terms of sensitivity and in, in terms of false discovery rate. Um, indels, which I, I always say, uh, you know, indels are the great white whale of variant calling, and, and Ahab always is in the building. 
Um, we, we were excited about the 10% the increase in sensitivity for the indels, but much more markedly was the more than 45% decrease in the false discovery rate uh, for individuals, again, who have spent a lot of time calling indels with GATK, you know that it can call some kind of spurious stuff, particularly in things that might look like soft clip reads and, and without a ton of evidence. Now, to, to make sure this looked really clean, we, we also did look across all the regions, not just the high confidence regions in the genome in a bottle, and those trends in terms of sensitivity and, and the false discovery rate uh, continue pretty much straight through. As far as val validating GLNexus, I'm going to show a couple images that uh, from, from the white paper for GL Nexus that were also at, uh, at AGBT, but looking at this, establishing the sensitivity of a tool across these large joint genotype cohorts, I, I think is a little more complicated than just throwing an A12878 in and then seeing how that particular sample performed. <laughs> so, we had, we, so we wanted to think of some other ways that we could kind of at least back into estimations of how those were performing. So the first thing that we looked at was there were 50,000 samples that were joint genotyped after being run through GATK's haplotype collar, through both GLNexus and uh, GATK's joint genotyper. And looking at the kind of binning by the number of allele copies against the relative frequency of those alleles in the, in the cohort, we did see with GLNexus a significant increase in the sensitivity to rarer alleles. Granted, we don't know that all of those are 100% are real, but we were able to evaluate our specificity kind of using another methodology that, that made us feel really comfortable about that. So I'm going to take a step aside for just a moment before getting to that, just to remind anyone who doesn't really front of mind have their, their ninth or 10th grade biology class in Mendelian genetics uh, ready just to, to set up what this is. So the idea being that, you know, two individuals passing on their genetics to their child if both parents have a, a large A allele, you know, you'd expect the child to have a large a, two large A alleles, too small, and, and so on. Where we start to see kind of Mendelian inheritance violations or de novo variation is when both parents have the, the big A and, and child somehow ends up with a small A or both have small and they end up with a big, and we call that a Mendelian inheritance violation. Now, granted, there are absolutely de novo variations that show up in, in every generation, However, by evaluating the rate that we see these across the data set that's joint genotype, we feel confident in, or we feel more confident in a, a, a joint genotyper that has kind of a, a lower rate of Mendelian inheritance violations. We were in a, a special place with, with the data we have because within our Geisinger data set, using our, that Primus uh, relationship estimation, we, we were able to identify 877 trios or non-reported that are absolutely genetic trios, where we could evaluate how this was actually performing. And this is, again, work done by Mike Lynn, where he evaluated, again, the rate of Mendelian inheritance violations. And you can see, again, particularly in indels, that that rate in, in GL nexus was much lower than for GATK's joint, uh, joint haplo, gene genotyper, excuse me. So now for our, our data deliveries, and this is kind of what the data delivery for UK Biobank looks like, and this is the data that will eventually be made public. Uh, we've moved also away from BAM to CRAM, so we have a single sample CRAM and GVCFs. Uh, we did make the move to CRAM, fully lossless, but we find that on a per sample basis that gives us really a two to three fold uh, reduction in data footprint per individual. Uh, we are still including our, our loss function uh, roll ups, the Plink formatted versions of both our unfiltered and Goldilocks PVCF, our relationship estimations, CLAMS calls, and, and the, our genotype data. And so to kind of wrap up, I, I want to touch on a couple points that I think are, are, are really salient when, when thinking about the evolution of your own uh, variant pipelines or, or even starting new pipelines is that your pipeline really has to be designed for your data and for your data needs, right? Every bioinformatics person at some point has interacted with someone who says, you know, but I, I've run this pipeline for seven years on my data. Why don't you just do this one? And it's like, well, that was for data collected from seven different sites for four different captures, and you needed to get that very specific. And, and you really need to tune your data to your needs. But the other thing I, I will say is that even tuning that data to your needs, you have to make sure that your data outputs are, are really across the, the, the spectrum in terms of what people can do with it. And I, I'm generally resistant to putting things in Plink format, but I also recognize there's a, a lot of discovery that people can do and, and make on, on my data in that format. Uh, and finally, I'll say that looking at things like how we validated with GL Nexus, 
and kind of touching on something Brett was talking about even this morning, is that we, I think we need to identify some new ways to benchmark how tools perform outside of just the genome in a bottle or these super well-characterized samples where we feel confident in calls that have been reinforced by variant callers that really all run essentially the same algorithm. Uh, and with that, I will open to questions. Thank <laughs> you.